you have to find all pairs of whole numbers for which 1 plus 2 to the x plus 2 to the 2x plus 1 is y squared. And if you replace 2 to the x with z, it would be 1 plus z plus 2z squared is y squared. And it turns out all you need is a little factorization. You move the 1 to the other side, factor the right side as y minus 1 times y plus 1, and that equals something with large powers of 2 in it, um, 2 to the x at least. So first of all, y minus 1 and y plus 1 must be consecutive even integers. Um, and furthermore, only one of them can be divisible by at least 4. So one of them is divisible by 2, and one of them is divisible by 2 to the x minus 1. So you get a big power of 2 that divides exactly one of the terms. And so y is either a big power of 2 minus 1 or a big power of 2 plus 1. And it turns out that you just examined both of those cases and you easily get the answers. Nothing was working. It was ridiculous. Finally, Zooming's words came back to me. You will never have to use Pell's equation on problem 1 or 4. Instead, you should do something simple, like factoring. So I looked back at the equation, and actually, like, you subtract 1 from both sides and factor it, and you get a very easy solution of the problem. And you easily see that um, x had to be 1 or 2, so there were only, like, two things you had to test. and those things worked, and you were done. Four, I think, might have actually been submitted by Zooming Fong, our coach. Uh, I think it was, and we all solved it. It was sort of a straightforward number theory problem, and we, we were very well trained to be able to, you know, just sit down, work it out in a set amount of time, and be able to write it up pretty much perfectly. I think we might have lost points there, one of our guys, for uh, not noticing that integers could be negative. Which, you know, it's a bit of a problem, but uh, overall our team did very well on that. I had a little bit of trouble with it at first since I wasn't really sure how to start, but eventually I realized to subtract 1 from both sides and then factor out 2 to the x. And then after that it was easy, but I actually made a... I left out a few, like, very simple cases, so I actually lost the point on that problem. Problem 5. Let p of x be a polynomial of degree n greater than 1 with integer coefficients, and let k be a positive integer. Consider the polynomial q of x equals p of x nested k times. Prove that there are at most n integers t such that q of t equals t. This was my favorite problem, and it was a problem that actually got a lot of people. So, problem 5 says you have a polynomial with integer coefficients, like 1 plus x squared plus 5x cubed or something. And you iterate it. What that means is you take, so the polynomial is p of x. Instead of p of x, we look at p of p of p of x, or p three times of x. They read it. And you call that q of x. So q of x could ha is a polynomial with a much larger degree. It's also an integer polynomial. And the problem is to prove that there are at most, uh, if the degree of p is n, you have to prove that the number of whole number roots of q is at most n. And this, at first, it's not obvious at all because q could have a really large degree. q could be a polynomial with degree n times anything. So in theory, it could have hundreds of roots. Uh, the right way to go is just, um, well, to use a, a little lemma that I didn't know about. Um, if a number t is a fixed point, or if a number t satisfies p of p of p of p of etc. of p of t equals t for some number of iterations, then it either satisfies p of t equals t or p of p of t equals t. So it's a fixed point of degree 1 or 2. Um, and it turns out that's one of the key observations for this problem. Well, I got one step, which is like to note that the, the numbers t such that q of t equals t, they come in cycles because if q of t equals t, then q of p of t equals p of t. And then you can sort of generate a few solutions that way. But yeah, that basically gave me a lot of trouble. A lot of the other uh, contestants, they figured out that part. If um, 
q of x equaled p of p of x, but they couldn't do the larger ones because they didn't realize that there was this really easy proof that reduced it to that case. They hadn't seen that problem. Uh, Arnov also solved it using his super geniusness. If you take two polynomials, you, you know, putting the value at A, putting the value at B, if you subtract them, the constant term will, of course, disappear. And then you look at all those terms, you know, of the same power, a to the nth power and b to the nth power, you subtract them, you can factor out a minus b. So it's a very simple fact. But this problem, I would say, use this fact to almost the nicest way you can have. You know, it's just this fact going back and forth f three or four times, you solve the problem. Problem six. Assign to each side b of a convex polynomial p the maximum area of a triangle that has b as a side and is contained in P. Show that the sum of the areas assigned to the sides of P is at least twice the area of P. So this is a very difficult combinatorial geometry problem. On uh, the number six, now the dismal tone will probably start to set in the dismal gloominess. Uh, so combinatorial geometry, and it was really disappointing for us because number one was a geometry and it was almost a trivial geometry. So we had been hoping for you know, a rather difficult geometry on day two so that we could you know, really show off our geometry skills. And then it was combinatorial geometry, which is, I don't know, probably the hardest subject out there. And I don't think any of us got anywhere except for Alex. Um, I wish I could say more about it, but I can't because I really didn't get anywhere on the problem. For any particular side, you look at the biggest triangle you can have in this polygon containing that side and some other point in the polygon. You t take the area of that side, the area of that triangle, and you, you write it next to that side. You have to show that the sum of all those areas is at least twice the area of P. In the worst case, two times the area of P. So I found some of the equality cases, but I didn't have time to work on the problem. The idea is to sort of smooth away the edges until all of the edges are parallel. Well, the opposite edges anyway. Um, and I think the way to see that is that is to notice equality occurs when the, poly when the polygon is centrally symmetric. So I noticed that it works for a par parallelogram, but I didn't realize that there was a more general equality case. Um, and I think noticing that, or guessing that at least, um, leads to the idea of smoothing away non-parallel edges. You try to make uh, the polygon have less edges and you keep doing this until it becomes a regular polygon. Or you try to make the, you, have to, you try to show that the polygon, if it's a bad polygon, then you could turn it into, you, you could keep it a bad polygon and turn it into a regular polygon. But for a regular polygon, the problem's obviously true. So it had to be a good polygon. That's the argument. I didn't see this argument. Only, the only person who solved this problem was Alex Jai. But he missed like some step that he thought was obvious, but was actually pretty difficult. And he only got three points on the problem, so he didn't get a gold medal just because of that. So I basically got, got it down to having polygons with opposite sides parallel to each other. And then I thought those polygons worked, and I didn't realize the opposite sides had to be equal length. So I think, I think I should have been able to solve it if I'd realized that, but I didn't. So I never completed the solution during the test. I guess it was just one of those things you see or you don't, and about half of us did.